Hello, everyone. Welcome to PolyGage Power Hour. Uh, we are recording today's session just to let you know, but since no attendee information or photo will ever be visible and any submitted questions will be unattributed, we hope this isn't a problem for anyone. Uh, hopefully you're joining us today it means you are safe and warm and, and have, uh, have power and it's been quite a, quite a week. Uh, I know here in the United States, at least for those of you joining us from the US. Uh, so welcome, we're so glad you're here. On the questions front, uh, please submit those to us at any time during our discussion today using the chat button that you should see at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can. But I'm Christine Davies. I'm the founder and CEO of PolyGage. We're the world's first online marketplace offering expertise across the full spectrum of government affairs, from policy issues to political systems to public affairs in 10 distinct knowledge areas. And our PolyGage Power Hour programming aids to provide, aims to provide expert assessment of key policy and political issues at all levels of government, helping companies and organizations gain better political knowledge to help you build more effective government affairs engagement strategies, utilizing the hard-earned knowledge of the members of the PolyGage Experts Network to help us focus on the who, the what, the when, and the why of important government activities. And today, we're pleased to be focusing on the road ahead uh, for policy and regulatory issues related to environment and climate, largely focused on the United States, but will inevitably, I'm sure, dip into some global policy and coordination issues. And our discussion is being anchored by three members of the PolyGage Experts Network today. Joe Britton, the president of Pioneer Public Affairs and founder of the Business Climate Initiative. Bob Hickmott, senior vice president at the Smith Free Group and Aaron Sabo, partner at CGCN. I do have to say this seems like an auspicious day to be having a discussion about climate and environment. Uh, as I mentioned a minute ago, we certainly are experiencing changing weather patterns that are causing devastation in the Midwest of the US, although every country has seen changes. And tactically, if we put politics and opinions aside about the situation, what we do know is that there's gonna be government activity coming out of the situation. Uh, in the form of legislation, regulatory changes, and likely even through executive orders at the national and state or local levels that companies and organizations need to know about and be prepared to potentially respond to. And so with that overview and, and broad introduction, Joe, let me first turn to you. Uh, prior to launching Pioneer Public Affairs, you spent 15 years working in the US Senate, most recently as Chief of Staff uh, to Senator Heinrich of New Mexico and earlier with Senators Udall and Nelson. And you also worked earlier for then and now current uh, US uh, Department of Agriculture Secretary Vilsack. And of course, there's a lot of discussion going on right now about the impacts of the ag industry on climate and environment issues and vice versa. Uh, so we look forward to hearing, tell us uh, what you think is key for people to understand about the road ahead for environment and climate issues. Um, well, thanks, Christine. It's a pleasure to be here. And I think one of the most important things for people to think about is kind of what happens after this current uh, COVID uh, American Rescue Plan. And I think, you know, when we talk about uh, climate change, I think, you know, many folks see this as a once in a decade, once in a lifetime opportunity uh, to make real progress on climate change. And I think, you know, that spans, um, you know, big uh, infrastructure investments that may include soil and forest carbon at the Department of Agriculture. Um, I think there's a big debate about whether that's a clean energy standard or carbon pricing um, when it comes to macroeconomic uh, carbon reductions throughout the economy. I mean, it's certainly gonna mean um, executive action, whether that's you know, uh, what I think is a, a, a groundbreaking social cost of carbon um, that has been uh, presented um, recently and new fuel and greenhouse gas, um, uh, as fuel economy and greenhouse gas standards out of EPA for our transportation sector. So there's going to be a lot of activity. Um, I think the big investments and the opportunity that Congress has is gonna be one of the primary drivers. Um, timing wise, um, you know, I, I think this will all be kicked off um, sometime in the next 30 to 45 days with the skinny budget coming out of the Biden administration. Obviously he signaled that that's gonna be anchored in a, a build back better um, narrative. Uh, I think that's going to include, you know, important issues like the caring economy, 
Uh, it's going to be, you know, domestic manufacturing. It's certainly going to be racial equity, but I think on the climate front, it'll also be about infrastructure and green jobs. And I think where that goes, and, you know, I think you can look at um, the, the uh, Green Act, you can look at HR2 in the House side. I think some of the big drivers, um, certainly in the, in the Senate, will be some of the more determining factors of what gets in a big climate bill. But to me, I think that's really a, you know, the, 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 the kickoff is policy consideration wise is likely to be March 15th. That's when uh, the UI benefits expire. Um, I think that's everybody's goal as for a date to pass the American Rescue Plan. That may slip a little bit, but you know my hope certainly is that we're able to consider a strong climate bill between uh, March and August. I think after it slips past August, I think you get into midterms uh, and you get into other complications that I'd certainly like to avoid, uh, or at least those that are cheering on a, a big uh, investment in green jobs and infrastructure. Um, so, you know, what are the limitations? I think certainly everybody's first choice is that it be a bipartisan bill. Um, and there's still, I think, some talk, certainly Senator Sinema and Manchin and, and to some degree Stabenow are holding out hope. I think one of the lessons learned um, from a decade ago uh, with Obamacare, though, was that, you know, Max Baucus spent a year and a half seeking to gain uh, bipartisan support from, you know, Senators Grassley and Enzi and others. And I think most, um, certainly in the, in the Democratic establishment, consider that to be a template of how not to get rope doped and push yourself up against a midterm in a really dangerous way that's uh, detrimental to you know, a you know, what is a critical window of, uh, to pass legislation. So I think you know, plan A is certainly bipartisan, but I think uh, it will be a very short fuse and plan B will be uh, reconciliation. Um, and I think there's been some um, you know, denigration of the reconciliation process. But as a reminder, that was used for the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts for the 2017 Trump tax cuts. Um, so it is a, it is a, you know, authorized process. It's one that has got a long precedent and history to it. Um, and so I don't think Democrats are going to feel guilty about using a process that, you know, only requires 50 votes in the Senate. And I think they'd be happy to have, you know, Senators Murkowski and Collins, and um, you know, and uh, and uh, you know, uh, you know Romney and others that might want to vote for it. I think they'd welcome those votes, but I don't think they're going to artificially set a higher threshold um, unnecessarily. And I think that's really the, you know, the, the benefit of reconciliation. The other thing that's important to think about, and you know, we could spend the entire hour talking about the Bird Rule and the reconciliation process, but I think the thing that is most important for folks to think about is that the, the, the two-part test that's most important is that it has to have a budgetary impact and it, and, it can, um, and, and it can't be merely incidental. So the parliamentarian will be making judgments about whether this is truly a budgetary impact or something that is 80% policy and merely a you know, 10 or 20% budgetary tangential impact. So that'll be the lens with which um, I think you know, members of the House and Senate are gonna be thinking through what's eligible for reconciliation. And I think it certainly narrows the path. I think, in the, you know, obviously the current reconciliation bill, there's a big debate about the minimum wage and whether or not that meets that test. That's the kind of example of an on the, you know, on the line or on the fence policy call that, you know, the parliamentarian is going to have to work through. Um, that process takes time. I think, you know, that's the answer to why this bill doesn't pass in April or May or maybe even June. Um, you've got to have a, you know, you've really got to have a tight, um, um, you know, process and, and have your ducks in a row and have an understanding where the parliamentarian is going to rule so that you don't fall out of bounds of the reconciliation rules, surprisingly, at the last minute. So you've got to put a lot of work into it. Um, so I, I really am aspirational about the opportunity to pass a big climate bill. Um, it's going to be more arduous uh, than, than ever. Uh, but it's also more important than ever. And I think, you know, you think about some of the progress that we need to make um, to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050, which is, I think, all the experts are telling us. Um, that's not a, you know, we shouldn't see that as a, a, a date that's 30 years into the future. I think we need to see it as a date that every decision we make in the next several months are important to the next decade. And what's important to the next decade is really consequential for the next three decades. Um, and if we don't get this done, um, I think, you know, shame on us. You've seen a lot of business leaders across the spectrum leading on this. Um, and I think the public wants us to be here um, really as a matter of public policy and leadership. Um, you know, 
they're the only ones left behind, right? The, the, the business sector and the public and everybody else has told, told us that this is the path we need to go down. There's dire consequences and it's our only shot to really get it right. So it's an important conversation. I'm happy to be a part of it and, um, and look forward to uh, uh, the others in our, our Q and A. And you're on mute. First time that's happened, right? Thank you, Bob. Um, Joe, thank you for that fantastic, uh, fantastic overview of kind of how the sausage is being seasoned, uh, as I'm sure it's it's getting ready to be made. We did have a question come in uh, that said, Joe mentioned this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, sense of whether there's any disagreement between the Biden administration and the Democrat controlled Congress on priorities uh, for legislation, whether it's standalone or it's integrated into uh, other legislative packages coming down the pike. So I actually think from an aspiration standpoint, there's no separation. Um, the, and I know Bob and, and Aaron are gonna talk about this, but there's a, a permeating sense of climate priorities in every agency and every department. This is a top, top priority. So I think in that sense, uh, there's no separation. I think some of the more difficult questions that we're gonna confront um, are gonna be in the power sector. So is this a clean energy standard? Um, is it a carbon price uh, across all sectors? Um, and I think, you know, even the, the clean energy standards that have been created to be eligible for reconciliation have a more uh, financial component to them, and they're starting to look more and more like carbon pricing. So I think those are the areas where there may, I wouldn't describe it as a disagreement. I would describe it as really smart people trying to dig through the policy and figure out what the right answer is. Um, and I think, you know, that's probably the most consequential. Um, there's some design elements of a soil or forest carbon um, contribution to climate that I think, again, it's not a disagreement, but I think smart people are trying to figure out how to quantify it, how to measure it, how to support some of the, um, the proprietary markets that have cropped up for carbon in order to leverage private sector investments and in dollars. So um, I think, you know, everybody knows the interest and knows the, the kind of the, the stakes. It's all a matter of making sure we get it right, given the limitations of the process we have. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Um, Bob, let me next turn to you. You've been on the front lines of environment and climate issues for much of your career as well. I know you've recently served as the on the EPA's Superfund Policy Task Force, uh, previously as counselor to then uh, HUD Secretary Andrew Cuomo and advisor to HUD's Brownfields Cleanup Program and have served as a member of President Clinton's Council on Sustainable Development and then as an associate administrator at EPA under the leadership of Carol Browner, uh, where you worked on numerous environmental issues. So uh, looking really forward also to hearing your thoughts. Uh, what does the road ahead look like over this next year? What should be top of mind for people as we start going down this road? Well, thank you, Christine. And it's a pleasure to join Aaron and, and Joe. Um, as a uh, native Delawarean, I'm pleased that my former boss, Joe Biden, has now done well by himself and finally made it to the White House. I guess I'd have two thoughts today. One is to emphasize when the three of us talk about infrastructure, infrastructure is gonna have a very broad meeting going ahead in this Congress and in this administration. It's not gonna be just the traditional highway bill, the highway tax, um, WERDA, um, you know, bridges and roads. It's gonna be rural broadband. It's gonna be grid modernization. It's gonna be maybe some lessons learned from what we're, we're experiencing right now in Texas. So think broadly when you think infrastructure, not just the traditional way that, that we've gone about it. Um, and the second would be just as Joe referenced how broad based climate is gonna be in this administration. Um, I think Joe Biden was kind of a late comer to uh, climate policy. I think the, the progressive base pushed him a bit during the primary process, but he's all in. And I'm just gonna go through a tick list of some of the players in the administration just to give you an idea. So on the international side, you mentioned, um, you know, obviously you've got John Kerry, former Secretary of State, who is uppermost working with Tony Blinken on re-engaging with the Paris Accord on the, on the international side. On the domestic side, you've got Brian Deese at the National Economic Council. Brian was one of the negotiators on the Paris um, Accord during the Obama administration. It just shows you how they're putting climate uppermost in all um, economic factions of, of the administration. And then just some players you don't traditionally think about on climate, but you've got Janet Yellen at Treasury, who's long been an advocate for a carbon tax. You've got Merrick Garland nominated for um, 
uh, Attorney General and Department of Justice, um, a strong environmental justice advocate and his, his past rulings and his history. Um, and then you, you're, I, I don't know if we're gonna call her the czar, but the climate de facto czar in the White House is gonna be Gina McCarthy, a very smart woman, you know, worked for Governor Romney in Massachusetts at one point, came down to EPA, was the architect of the Clean Power Plan and the Biden administration, the uh, Obama administration. She will be the in-house person at the White House on, on climate policy. Um, Brenda Mallory, who has a um, environmental justice history, will be over at CEQ. And then uh, Joe's colleague from New Mexico, Deb Holland, will be going over to Interior first Native American to have that role and we'll certainly bring her perspective on tribal issues, tribal priorities as they intersect on climate issues. Uh, Jennifer Granholm at uh, Department of Energy, um, very outspoken on um, electric vehicles, um, wants to increase the funding on ARPA-E for R&D at Energy. Pete Buttigieg at Transportation, really don't know yet, you know, former mayor, former McKinsey um, alumnus, um, is saying the right things, but he's got as his number two, a woman named Polly Trottenberg, who um, has worked for Senator Schumer, Senator Boxer, uh, has worked for Mayor de Blasio, very, very accomplished policy person um, as the number two person at DOT. And I think at some point we'll probably see an infrastructure czar point person in the, um, in the Biden White House, the way that Trump tried to do early on with DJ Gribben, and then it just kind of didn't go any further from there. Um, HUD, Marsha Fudge, Ohio. Um, I think this is a way to get into energy retrofits, making public housing more energy efficient, um, using some of the economic tools like CDBG, Section 108, to help retrofit for climate change. Um, uh, Joe talked a little bit about uh, uh, Senator, uh, Governor Vilsack of, of Department of Agriculture uh, doing things like carbon set aside and some of the other things that maybe traditionally people didn't think of when they thought of agriculture. And then enforcement, and this is something that's very important for you to take away of, there will be a lot more disclosure going to be required of companies going forward. You're gonna see that out of the, the SEC with Gary Gensler. You're likely to see it out of FERC with Rich Glick, both of whom have a good track record on climate change, and you're gonna see a lot more requirements going forward. And then science, this is the first time that the president's science advisor in any administration has been elevated to cabinet level. Um, Eric Lander is the new science advisor for um, President Biden from day one. And I think he and a, uh, a council of advisors on science and technology will permeate everything that happens within the administration writ large. EPA specifically, um, Michael Regan has been nominated, has had his confirmation hearing. Um, a little bit of a surprise. I think most people thought that Mary Nichols from California who um, I worked with when she ran the air office and then has been at, the, at CARB out in California was the likely uh, front runner. Um, that's where I think we saw the influence of the environmental justice community kind of flex its muscles and, and show that maybe they had some problems with Mary Nichols. So they chose Michael Regan, who was a, an accomplished environmental commissioner from the state of North Carolina. He was at EDF. He previously was in the Clinton EPA. And um, I think, Two of his accomplishments while in North Carolina, one was going after uh, Duke Energy on coal ash spills, and the other was going after Comores on PFAS or these forever chemicals in the Cape Fear River. So I think he will bring a level of um, state experience and enforcement that you know perhaps we haven't seen the last few years. His chief of staff is very accomplished, Dan Utek. Um, he's a veteran of the Senate, worked for Senator Clinton when he was there. Uh, also worked in the Obama administration, um, really can hit the ground running, trying to run EPA. Um, the deputy for um, Michael Regan was, is going to be Janet McCabe, who's a past regulator from Indiana, but most recently in the Obama administration, ran the air office. So as the administration pivots from uh, what was the clean power plan to the uh, ACE plan of the Trump administration to a new version of a clean power plan, newly named, newly constructed, uh, Janet McCabe will be very much uh, have her hands on in that. And then uh, next to last, Carlton Whitehouse, kind of an unknown individual. He's a 
environmental professor at Howard University, will head Olam or the the uh, the silo within EPA that does all the things like Superfund, Brownfields, RICRA. I don't know much about him, but he will have a very strong environmental justice perspective, not unlike what Maddie Stanislaus had during the Obama administration. And then the career deputy is a longtime career guy named Barry Breen in Olam who will be moving that policy along as well. I think one thing to look for that'll be interesting will be the dynamic between uh, Gina McCarthy inside the White House, having run the EPA, with Michael Regan, new to the EPA, and then Jana McCabe, who is his deputy, who is a protege of, of Gina McCarthy's. And, you know, sometimes there are clashes in administrations. We hope they all work together all towards the same goal, but that has yet, yet to kind of unfold. Thank you. Fantastic, Bob. And, and you're right. Uh, even the best laid intentions, there's going to be some politics. There always will be even on the when you're on the same team. Um, we just had one question. It made me smile. It said, wow, with a series of exclamation points. Talk about a whole of government approach on this topic. It really how, is. <laughs> how will the administration work with states so that federal activity being explored isn't blocked or litigated incessantly? How should we approach our engagement there? I guess meaning, and maybe not at the state level, but in terms of uh, you know voicing state concern, maybe to the fed, feds about how they can collaborate better. Yeah, it used to be that there was a, um, a perception of a lack of capacity on the part of states to do environmental enforcement. That's why, particularly the NGOs, the environmental groups, would always stress for a strong federal role. Um, however, when you look at this new EPA, you've got Michael Regan, who came from a state state regulator. Um, you've got Jana McCabe, who was an Indiana regulator. Um, you've got Gina McCarthy, who was the Massachusetts regulator. So I think there is a comfort level of uh, that the states are trying to move in the right direction. Um, however, I don't think there would be any reluctance on enforcement in other areas to overfile in some states where they didn't think states were moving aggressively enough. Yep. No, that's super helpful and a great point that because so many of these administration players come from state backgrounds, that will likely be on their minds too in terms of the ripple effect and, and how these uh, policies and, and regulatory efforts will will be will impact and, and be embraced or not uh, at the state level. So thank you for that, Bob. Um, Aaron, let me now turn to you. You have spent many years involved in federal energy and environmental policy issues working under the Trump, Obama, and even the Bush administration, uh, numerous issues while at the White House Council on Environmental Quality or CEQ, um, and at the office of OMB where you focused on energy and environmental regulatory policy issues, both from a domestic perspective and also through the lens I understand with an international regulatory cooperation uh, perspective with numerous countries. So uh, that is a lot of lenses that you have, I know, to think through these issues. Uh, would love to hear how you're advising or encouraging people to think about the road ahead for the environmental and climate policy topics. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me and you know, Joe and Bob, because I'd be on panel with you all. Um, you know, I, I will say that um, just to start off, it's been rather uh, impressive to the extent that this administration has hit the ground running um, within the, the first week, uh, especially on climate change. We saw two, uh, well, more two EOs and then a number of presidential memorandum as well um, that really pushed uh, the climate change uh, narrative uh, plan forward rather aggressively. Um, we actually have the first uh, requirements or submittals due tomorrow uh, on a couple things, um, but as well as they laid out a whole plan for the first year. Um, and as uh, Bob and I've been talking about, you know, this is a whole of government plan. Um, what we can really look to um, is to see coming up, what are they actually doing with these reports? So uh, tomorrow there are two reports that are due. Just to give some context, executive order dates are missed all of the time. I would treat them more as uh, highly recommended instead of you must meet uh, type uh, dates. Um, the two things though that are supposed to come out by tomorrow, one is the interim social cost of carbon, which Joe kind of referenced to uh, about, um, whether that will be just reinstating the Obama administration social cost of carbon, um, as well as the other social cost of greenhouse gases the Obama administration did while they are spending the rest of the year uh, working on a whole new system for social cost of carbon and the other social cost of greenhouse gases. 
um, also due tomorrow, um, once again, this was a very aggressive schedule, um, was interim reports from every agency with what the Trump, starting at the beginning of the Trump administration all the way through of what regulatory actions that they've, uh, the Trump administration took that are counter to what this administration wants to do. Um, these are the, the significant ones, the ones that would go through interagency review, but that's to kind of the start the preliminary list to see, to lay out at least internally for the White House uh, and through the agencies, what are all the things that they're gonna be doing over the next year? And as Bob mentioned, you know, that is that is a whole lot that there's, uh, there's planned um, from the, you know, the fossil fuel industry to the mining industry to, uh, the car, uh, the vehicle industry. There's discussions about, you know, the ag industry. I mean, you name it. It's, it's there. Everyone's going to to be hit by the the climate change uh, implications of that. Um, with respect to getting this stuff done, um, this is something that you know you you saw a lot of narrative. Um, I think both in the Obama and the Trump administration about, oh, we did this, we did this. This administration with all the alums they have coming in from the Obama administration really understand um, the time that it takes to do these things. So you'll see uh, if you go back to those first week executive orders, those kind of actions, all they're referencing for timeframes is proposed rules. They're not saying, hey, the whole kit caboodle needs to get done in the next six months. They, they very much understand that's not possible. That's very difficult. And as uh, you know, Bob was talking about, you're gonna have a lot of differing opinions on how do they get to the goals that they wanna get to. And those fights um, take time. Those, their discussions, maybe not fights, hopefully not fights. Uh, those discussions take time about what to prioritize and how quickly do we get this, uh, get to the goal. Um, and you know, I'll just end on the, the thing that, um, to leave enough time for, for questions and so forth, was the question that Bob kind of got about with respect to, you know, the state suing and all and litigation risk just in general, that is a fundamental question. That is a, a fundamental issue that we've seen, especially related to climate change actions. We saw that um, with the clean power plan. Um, we've seen that where that got uh, stayed by the Supreme Court. We've seen the ACE rule that was just overturned uh, by the DC circuit, uh, I think less than a month ago. You just have a lot of questions that need to be answered, a lot of litigation that's going to be uh, occur. And so the real question, one of those questions is, is how good is good enough? How much risk are you going to take and how quickly do you want to get it done? And that's really where we're going to see um, a lot of where the political leadership and the career leadership interact is how quickly do you want to get it done? How much risk do you want to take um, on these questions? And, you know, at the end of the day, there will be lawsuits, um, you know, possibly from both sides. You know, one might be suing saying you're not going far enough, the other saying you're going too far. Um, and, you know, I'd say the only way to really prevent those kind of litigation risks is through Congress, right? That, you know, if, uh, the way to solve the, this back and forth, this pendulum swinging, which I don't think anyone thinks is good, um, is to really have Congress be able to, to, to take legislation and move that forward. And, and get something done to provide certainty for, for everyone in the country and the world. Thank you, Aaron. A great reminder that for all of the speeches and the outlines that are shared by our leaders, there's a lot of process <laughs> that happens uh, that accompanies that. And sometimes the process is on track, sometimes it gets derailed, but it's really important uh, for, for everyone to understand or to, to better try and better understand and to pay attention to. Um, we had a question come through that I'm, I'm going to direct towards you just because of your, you, you do have some experience in your background, I know, working on the international compliance front. The question is, do you have a sense of if there are any top priorities from uh, the uh, rest of the world, particularly the Paris climate signers, uh, that they're really hoping that the uh, United States uh, will sign on for or will uh, up their engagement on in the coming year? So I guess with the, the Paris Agreement, um, at least from the United States, the, the first thing that we're going to really see um, in, in the big announcement is um, President Biden has said that he wants to hold an April 22nd event, uh, international climate event. Um, it is highly likely, and I de defer to my, to my Democrat colleagues about if they have any additional knowledge about this, about getting their nationally determined contribution plan done before then that's, uh, you know, required under the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, you know, there could be, the Biden administration could say, hey, we're going to do a net zero by 2050. The Obama submission was only five pages to note. It's not like this is a super in-depth necessarily uh, plan. Um, but I would say that's the first uh, 
expecting to see kind of major uh, international announcement that's likely or that's more substantive that could come out um, from the Biden administration. Um, but I would say internationally, a um, couple of things I'd, I'd raise is you have uh, airplane standards, um, which the EU has been significantly involved in. Um, they themselves have, you know, been pushing for uh, a carbon tax type system when it comes to airplanes. And that includes even if you're just flying through Europe. So if you just land there and you're moving to another base, um, you know, there has been um, the Kigali Amendment, which has to do with uh, HFCs. That's an add-on to the Montreal Protocol. That's something that uh, President Biden put in his executive order to submit to Congress for ratification. Um, and then there's the International Maritime Organization, which has a net zero by 2050 goal as well. Um, but in general, I expect um, uh, that to kind of come from the EU areas. Um, and then for the developing countries, I expect uh, contributions for the, the Green Climate Fund that was part of Paris um, in making sure that gets plussed up or, or to the ability uh, increased uh, to help those uh, developing countries meet their goals as well. Just a few things to add to an already robust agenda. Thank you for that, Aaron. Um, we've got a question. Joe, I'll invite you to comment first, but then Bob and Aaron would, would welcome your inputs as well. It's pointing out how you know companies in particular have been uh, very much in the driver's seat on uh, pursuing environment and climate policy uh, efforts uh, uh, in recent years. Do you anticipate a change in that now that we've got, uh, there's a government, US government in place that is going to be very active on a uh, more a different version, I guess we should say, of, of environment and climate uh, policy approach. How will public-private partnerships, and I guess particularly the voice of the private sector, evolve uh, in this new stage? Oh, Joe, you're on mute too. Sorry. I think the most important thing to think through is kind of motivations, um, and I think that'll signal how uh, many of the business uh, entities engage. Um, I think you saw the business roundtable uh, this year come out and, and, and really take into consideration not just the bottom line, uh, but their community and some of their other uh, fiduciary responsibilities. Um, the Chamber of Commerce has um, started to say uh, the right things on climate change, which is good. I think you know we'll, we'll see where their advocacy is and um, hopefully their advocacy matches uh, some of the narrative. Um, but the other thing that I think is worth thinking through is the ESG rating environment. So this is the environmental, social, and governance rating. There is now trillions of dollars that will be driven in a capital uh, sense, an equity sense, uh, on, on those companies that have a strong ESG rating. Um, and it's not just because um, on the surface that's the right choice and the right decision to make. It's because these um, you know, large holding companies, pension funds, other governments are really looking at um, your environmental, social, and governance um, as a proxy for strong um, uh, leadership, but also as a form of liability, the kinds of risk that a company may be subject to from their community, um, from, um, from, from governance standpoints, or even their, um, their climate risk. And so I think that's increasingly driving uh, the narrative. Obviously, I think there's many, many companies that are uh, wanting to, you know, signal to the administration that they agree that they're a good actor in the space. But I think a lot of it has to do with the dollars, uh, as it often does. Um, the other thing I think through is there's increasingly, I think, collections of organizations um, that are really, you know, strong coalitions that are going to be driving decarbonization. Um, I think even in the last couple of days, you saw a variety of folks in the power sector come together on net carbon um, goals. You've got the Climate Leadership Council, you've got the CEO Climate Dialogue, you've got the, the Citizens Climate Lobby. A lot of companies are coming together and saying, we need a market-wide decarbonization strategy. Um, and I think that has to be a driver. So, you know, my strong hope is that, you know, at the end of the day, when we pass a climate bill, we'll have everybody rowing together. We may not see, you know, not to say that we're gonna avoid every political rut, but my strong hope is that the business community is going to, you know, really back up what they have said and the signals they've sent over the last couple of years and strongly support the climate bill and make clear to every community that it's that it's good for local economic development. It's good for our future. It's good for job creation. And it's really driving um, a new economy that we're building to be more resilient. And so I think the stars are aligning in a really productive way. Um, you know, I think you know, there's always room for things to fizzle out, but I think, you know, there's a lot of steam behind a strong decarbonization strategy right now. 
supported by business. Any any fear, Joe, that because of the you know stronger regulatory posture of this administration, the business community may back off a bit, or is your sense that they're they're really going to be energized uh, by this opportunity to push this agenda forward if that's what they're on board for? Well, I will I'll, I'll, I'll articulate my suspicion. Um, I think there's some in the oil and gas community who have supported a carbon price um, that have some uh, private conditions that are on that support. Um, one of which is that. Um, there's a deregulatory environment and that maybe it's the Clean Air Act or others that they have relief, it's contingent. The other is I think some of them, you know, secretly believe that um, they're only going to support a carbon price if support for renewable energy also gets unraveled. So um, there is a risk that some of the, um, I think, you know, narrative and, and, and messaging around this from some folks is, is paper thin. Uh, but I think that's that's really what you know, and I think you know that's an opportunity for those companies though uh, to put that suspicion aside. And so those are the choices that they're going to face. Um, and again, I think far more than what Joe Biden thinks or what any congressional leader thinks. I think those companies are paying a lot of attention to their ESG rating and whether or not they're going to have the financing as a going concern to run their business. Great, thank you for that, Christine. Uh, I can say two other factors. One I mentioned on. previously. That's going to be the role of the regulators. I think you've already seen proposed rules out of the CFTC. You're going to see it out of the SEC. You're going to see it out of um, FERC uh, requiring more disclosure from companies on their climate exposure. And I think you're also seeing it out of shareholders, an increasing number of shareholder resolutions going forward, not unlike the, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, the mutual funds and the venture capital funds who are requiring uh, a more aggressive posture from some of these companies. And you're seeing you know, we saw a French company Total leave API because they didn't think API was being progressive enough on climate. And you can see that more and more across the board. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, question coming in, uh, what after the Keystone Pipeline, are there other major projects, infrastructure or otherwise, that are likely under review by the Biden administration and maybe postponed or canceled? Any thoughts if there's anything that rises to the level, I guess, of the Keystone Pipeline? Yeah, I would say immediately DAPL, the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, that uh, got, so they, the uh, Biden administration asked for an extension, I think it was 59 days, basically two month extension from the court to make a decision on whether they were going to shut down that, that pipeline, which uh, unlike Keystone, which was not operating, DAPL is operating currently. Um, as to whether they have to shut that down. There's a lot of other knock-on impacts from um, on that, uh, the shutdown of DAPL, especially on the agricultural uh, community with respect to, it would have to move to rail. And now there's a lot of agricultural impact about rail uh, capacity uh, within the, the Northwest. Um, I think that's one, uh, Enbridge line three and line five are the other two kind of uh, ones that kind of get a lot of talk about. Um, but I'd say that the DAPL is, is, is a really, really big deal, uh, carries quite a bit of, of oil within this country. And I think uh, it's for, I think 40% actually comes from Native American lands. So there's also that aspect on that as well. Um, so I think that's really the next one that uh, the Biden administration will have to tackle about how they're going to move forward uh, you know, with the kind of oil and gas infrastructure pipeline. And that does bring up the clash of two factions that are very close to the Biden administration, the, the green faction and then labor. And so you're gonna see a, a clash of, you know, if they try to uh, uh, rescind permits and, and uh, step on development of these pipelines, what does that do to labor and what kind of voice do they have in this process? Great, thank you, Bob. Uh, and a follow-up from this person, I'll give you one more, this person, one more shot on their, on their questions, one more, one more chance. What about federal lands in terms of policy on uh, restricting federal lands and, and potential uh, development of, fed, excuse me, potential development of federal lands and potentially reimposing restrictions? Um, I guess just uh, before we answer that question, I think this actually just gets into a bigger, broader uh, kind of clash that's going to occur, which is the environmental permitting process versus the move to try and build it, even if it's to a new renewable, you know, net zero by 2050 goal, the kind of inherent clash that you have between those, which you're hearing from um, kind of ties into that union aspect as well. You know, they want to build, how can they build, you know, can you build back better without being able to build it all if the environmental permitting process is kind of preventing you from doing that. 
Um, with respect to the federal lands, um, in general, though, you've seen uh, the Biden administration through the executive orders uh, ask for a pause on oil and gas leasing. They clarified that's non-tribal to try and get around that, you know, the tribal issue with respect to federal lands where there's a lot of production. Um, you know, that is going to be a question as to how long will they try and make that pause? Uh, will that be similar to what they, uh, the Obama administri administration did on the coal uh, leasing moratorium where they did a programmatic EIS review saying you need to count, uh, take into account climate change. And then of course, as we've talked about before, litigation, you know, how long that pause is raises litigation concerns. Um, there's certain things in the Mineral Leasing Act requiring sales as well as trying to build any sort of infrastructure on federal lands could also be pulled in. Um, and of course, New Mexico has massive federal lands. And you've seen since that announcement that uh, oil companies have moved uh, still in the Permian Basin, but out of New Mexico to Texas to, to uh, state lands where you don't have those inherent uh, potential issues. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, another question coming in, to what extent do the recent electronic vehicle announcements by GM and other big automakers change the politics of climate change and the likelihood of action this year? Is that going to be a big deal? Well, I'll jump in here in that uh, I, I think it's a big deal, but it may not be for the reason that people think. Um, I think, you know, both GM and Ford, you know, GM has a goal by 2035 to be uh, emissions free. Uh, Ford announced yesterday a 2030 date, but that only applies to Europe. I'm encouraging them to extend that to the United States. Uh, but ultimately, the biggest driver, what that's really beneficial for is that loops in two really important constituencies. One is the auto dealers and really putting in place the training and the incentives for the dealerships to move those electric vehicles. So that's an incredibly important um, you know, supply chain uh, into every community. The second is that uh, it's, it's an important, I think, signal to uh, UAW and the labor um, commitment that both Ford and GM have, and certainly the footprint that they have in Detroit. So I think those are the two most important uh, drivers that are going to be, um, I think, you know, hoping to make a consequential impact on EVs. The thing that I will say is probably the catalyst for that, though, is there is a, a really distributed and growing electric vehicle sector uh, that has pushed those incumbents into that position. Um, you know, they for years, uh, Ford for years opposed the EV tax credit. Uh, GM joined with the Trump administration to unravel the CAFE standards. And I think even 30 days ago, they were lobbying against CAFE. Um, so I think, you know, this is a sign that they've had to respond to what is an insurgent kind of aspiring sector of distributed automotive companies. And if you look back to pre-World War II, it was a very uh, diverse sector. After the war, there was dramatic consolidation. That pendulum is swinging back. And so, you know, you, you obviously the, the, the most prominent is Tesla, but there are dozens of other companies in both the manufacturing and charging and component space that are doing really amazing work like Lordstown and Rivian and Lucid and Faraday and Arrival uh, and Proterra. Um, this, is a, this is something that these companies had to respond to because it's where the market is. And we can either cultivate the sector and have an advanced vehicle economy here that supports domestic manufacturing, or we're going to be importing these vehicles and ceding this leadership to foreign commercial interests. So that's really what's happening here. Thank you, Joe. Um, we've got a question coming in about federal funding, funding for green tech uh, for startups and other efforts across the country. Question is, will, do you expect this will be looked at across the federal government as well in terms of R&D funds that may exist at different agencies or departments? Or do you expect it may end up being coordinated out of the White House with funds pooled uh, to be invested in this way? I think the traditional lead has been DOE with ARPA-E and they were the ones with the stimulus money. Um, there's supposedly still a backlog of money in ARPA-E that hasn't even yet been deployed. Um, and I think in, in, in whatever new infrastructure bill and the DOE budget, you're going to see more money for, available for that. I, I do think you're going to get a little bit of a show and tell mentality from different cabinet secretaries to show that they have incubators within their agency, uh, programs, policies, um, announcements that they can make because they know that um, once we get past COVID, climate change is really the number one priority for this administration, along with, with the job creation. So I think there'll be pockets of money around. I think, you know, Brownfields is an example back during the Clinton days, um, while EPA had was the lead regulatory agency, 
HUD was the one that had all the money and all the economic expertise. And then they kind of seeded that during the Obama administration. But they have a lot of resources that can be used for um, uh, uh, development, green development, um, uh, contaminated lands in depressed areas that could be the, ex the expertise of a place like HUD or the Economic Development Agency Administration and Commerce, uh, not just the, the DOE money. Thank you, Bob. I have a feeling who, whoever asked that question uh, is, is feverishly researching ARPA-E right now. So that's, that's terrific. Um, another question coming in, what does a tax credit for energy storage look like? What about the timing of something like that? Any thoughts on that issue? Well, I, I guess I'll jump in. I mean, I think the timing of that is, um, you know, is likely to be the same as the, you know, the, the, the climate bill writ large. I think that's, you know, if, if it's not catching a ride there, I don't know where it is catching a ride. Um, I, I think one of the things um, that's also important to think about in the tax space um, is that many of the expansions, I think some people hope that it'll be retroactive to January 1. I think that it'll be a passage date. Um, and it may, you know, you may, you may, I think you're going to see prospective tax policy uh, for energy storage. And I think with, you know, with storage, normalization is kind of the big issue. It kind of splits all the interest, but um, in the utility space, we need energy storage and, you know, storage, um, utility scale storage, you know, to really, you know, close off those peaks. And I think obviously we've got kind of a, a unique event in Texas right now, but if we had more energy storage across um, you know, all of the, the grids, I think we would have a, a much more resilient grid. And that's an, you know, one of the biggest ways that we can, you know, provide some solace to consumers. And is it your sense, Joe, that the, the capacity is there, the technology is there to do that? It really is a matter of potentially funding and investment to make that happen? Yeah, the, yeah, the technology is there. Um, obviously, the price points are going to be coming down. It'll be more economical over time. I mean, the battery advancements that we're making right now are amazing. Um, and so, yeah, I think on the, on the on the utility scale, the really you know we have these we have these times of year where energy prices spike from fifteen dollars a kilowatt hour to you know two hundred or three hundred, mm -hmm. um, and I think the ability of and the dispatchability of storage utility scale storage is what is really going to be the the, the economy um, interest here. The 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 commercialization of it is just makes too much sense, and so I think with a little bit of a nudge from the federal government, we'll see a lot more deployment. Thank you. Um, um, please, Aaron. if I can just add in on, on the batteries, um, one of the fundamental, so we do have the funding issue, but we also just have the sheer uh, supply issue on the critical mineral side, which is also something that um, those interested in just the, you know, the upstream uh, capabilities of that um, with rare, whether they be rare earth minerals, uh, copper, cobalt, gallium, you know, there's a, a number of various critical minerals that are, are used within the battery sector and that supply chain um is not really localized within the united states there's questions about just once again when you start talking about significant battery uh uptake within the united states uh there's there's concerns people have raised about national security and so forth about just that inherent supply chain so as that battery usage goes up um i think that there's going to be and that there has been interest in the hill and in the administration about this but i think that's only going to just uh, grow exponentially as we rely on refineries outside the United States, mining a lot out of the United States, um, and just how do we create uh, some sort of uh, consistent stockpile within the United States uh, to ensure that if we are going to, you know, as we expand battery usage, uh, that we do have those supplies. Yeah, and Christine, I might jump in here again, because I think it is an important opportunity for North America. Um, we've got lithium uh, deposits in Nevada and the Carolinas. Uh, we have, um, there's, there's cobalt that we can explore domestically. We obviously have a strong copper uh, development sector. Um, so to me, I think this is a job creation, a domestic manufacturing opportunity for the country. The thing that I would, um, I think, put a flag out there is most of the time, the folks that are um, raising concerns about supply chain, uh, it is on behalf of the refiners of the world, and they very rarely are swearing off their laptops or cell phones that rely on those same critical materials. So I would call it a, uh, a red herring at best, uh, but if we want to solve the issue, there's a way to do it. And I think it involves um, really, I think, you know, creating a domestic manufacturing uh, tax credit. So there's a 48C tax credit uh, that I think is going to be proposed. Um, actually, the Trump administration on December 1st 
um, put in critical materials as a key piece of the advanced technology vehicle manufacturing program. So there's bipartisan support for doing this in the right way. I think the, the benefit of doing it domestically is that we can apply kind of world-class labor and environmental standards to get it right. Thank you for that, Joe. That'll definitely be something interesting to watch, uh, given a variety of interests around, I, I would think, different sides of that table. Um, we have a bit of a crystal ball question for you guys. Uh, I'm going to assume that there will be carbon tax enacted. Help me understand the roadmap for likely reporting compliance and enforcement mechanisms. Uh, again, certainly something that's a bit anticipatory, but there's been a lot discussed about you know, this, uh, this, this potential happening, and especially given, I think, what Bob was saying about even Secretary Yellen uh, having a dispensation towards this, but there's more that would have to happen than just uh, her opinion or her, her, her belief in that. Would love to hear thoughts on that. I'm a skeptic. Um, while I think there's merit for a carbon tax, and I think it raises an enormous amount of money that could be used for a uh, 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 environmental uh, uh, a fund and there's a way to do rebates back to lower incomes. Um, I just don't think the politics are, are yet there in this Congress uh, going forward. You know, I mean, while the Democrats have the have the gavel and the leadership in, in the Senate, um, Mitch McConnell has come out against uh, uh, carbon tax, uh, most taxes in general. Uh, you've got a um, you've got a 2022 cycle where the majority of the senators up are Republicans again. Uh, I think that's a very difficult issue for them to run on. Um, you've got a very narrow margin for the Democrats in the House. So at this point, I don't see a carbon tax getting enacted. Okay, thank you, Bob. Other thoughts, Joe or Aaron? Are you in the- Let Aaron go first. <laughs> Aaron, what do you think the odds are of this happening and, and what may happen? Oh, I, I extremely slim. Um, I mean, for everything that Bob just said, I mean, they. They tried it with Waxman Markey. They've tried it a number of times. It, it has not gone well. Um, I think that it helps solidify the Republicans. Um, it's very easy to be uh, anti, you know, anti-tax. Um, I mean, I would say that there's a higher probability of them raising the gas tax, and I think that's exceptionally low uh, before they do something like that. I, I would mention the, the one thing that's interesting that there hasn't been a lot of talk about is a carbon adjustment tax of a border tax on, on uh, CO2 or just greenhouse gases in general, which, um, you know, you, you split a lot of industries there, um, but it, it's one of those things where I, I do think that the narrative is slightly easier or better than necessarily a carbon tax, um, especially on how it's messaged. But I, I think a carbon tax is, is extremely low probability. And then when you get into the how do you implement it, that is something that's you know, multiple agencies across, like, I don't think it's just going to be IRS, you'd have EPA, what type of MMRV do you use? How intrusive is that? Like, you know, and they dealt with that, uh, you know, some in the clean power plan when the proposed rule, it got all the way to the point where they were saying, we can go into your house and look at your energy efficiency standards. And that got a lot of pushback uh, from a lot of people. Um, but, you know, do you start doing that then? You know, it's, there's a lot of issues to, to, to work through. Thank you. Well, Christine, you found some disagreement, which is good. I am more bullish on this um, and, I, and for a couple reasons, and actually Aaron mentioned it, our, our counterparts, our trading partners are going to have a, a, a border adjustment carbon tax. Um, and so we will be putting ourselves at a competitive disadvantage if we don't have it. We'll be paying it either way. Um, so my personal view is that if we pass a climate bill without a strong decarbonization, a macroeconomic decarbonization lever, and it can be a clean energy standard for the power sector and a modest um, carbon price in other sectors, there's a lot of different ways to construct it. But to me, everything else is just scratching around the edges. We're not going to be able to just clean tech invest our way out of the big picture carbon uh, challenge, the, the hole that we've dug for ourselves. Um, and so I, um, I agree that, um, that it, is, it can be seen as an easy political target, but the polling for both a carbon tax and a clean energy standard is well into the 60 percentages. So I think our hope here is that in combination with nearly unanimous business sector support for this, um, that there is a clean way where that everybody's abiding by the same rules and you're providing a dividend and investing in a, a just transition, uh, which is both for environmental justice concerns, but I think also carbon communities. That's how we actually take this moment and do something meaningful. 
we've been in these big junctures before in our history, whether it was, you know, world wars, uh, racial injustice in the 60s. Um, and we've grown better as a country because we've invested and we've done big, bold things. So I think if we think through uh, a climate bill that doesn't achieve macro level decarbonization, we will have missed a huge opportunity to make a difference here. And that'll be a lost opportunity that will last decades. Well, no problem to have disagreement on these issues because we're all trying to forecast and uh, figure out, you know, what this road ahead is going to look like. I think whoever asked that question, if they were standing at a whiteboard hoping to jot down what uh, what they were going to be instructed to think about, is is probably a little disappointed. But but we'll see if it uh, if it comes in the in the months ahead. Um, not surprisingly, we have filled our time. Uh, we have really no. Uh, I think we have a couple of questions left. I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to you today. Feel free to be in touch with us after the fact. And if we can uh, relay or, or help uh, manage those follow-up questions, we would be happy to. Um, rather than a closing question then, let me just offer to uh, Bob and, and Aaron and Joe, any final thoughts you'd like to impart on the group in terms of you know, what is kind of the one key takeaway that you think would be really uh, useful for folks as they're trying to think about what you've really uncovered as being an incredibly dynamic, multi-pronged uh, set of issues related to the environment and climate topic. I guess my perspective would be, we have an administration that seems like it wants to do more than maybe talk about the issue, but wants to try to enact it. And as I talked about before, um, you know, we don't know what the outcome is gonna be, but I think they're gonna mobilize all the tools that they have at, at their disposal and the administration across the board to try to try to address that agenda. Thank you, Bob. And I'll just say, in addition to the administration and the business community, we've got generational focus here. I think that that is the pressure that is really, um, you know, a kind of an unsung hero of the movement is that, you know, grandparents are hearing it from their grandkids, parents are hearing it from their children. This is something that, you know, there's a lot of demand to focus and actually take real action finally. Aaron, um, closing word. Yeah, um, I guess I'll, I'll try and be optimistic and uh, say that, you know, the the hope is that, you know, especially on we can get Congress to if, if something's going to happen, we get Congress to do it. And there's a way that, you know, it it's able to make sure that, you know, if we're moving to this, uh, you know, let's say net zero by 2050, it's done by uh, also making sure that we're protecting the people today, letting them build here, um, you know, making sure that you know, the Democrats give a little, the Republicans give a little, and, you know, we come to an agreement that, you know, we can, you know, make sure that we're uh, building the, the things here and that we're the, we're the lead on, on the future um, and not ceding that to, to other countries to, to take advantage of. Fantastic. Thank you, Aaron. Just another reminder, this is uh, going to be something to watch for sure in the in the months and, and, and certainly years to come, but especially the coming months. Um, Joe, Bob, and Aaron, thank you so much for your insights and your advice today. We'll remind everyone that Joe, Bob, and Aaron are available to be booked for private consultations uh, or other engagements through polygage.com. Would welcome you to continue the conversation with any or all of them. And we all hope that you'll join for our next scheduled PolyGage Power Hours. We have a discussion of the national agenda for numerous aspects of the healthcare policy issue, another multi-pronged uh, uh, issue uh, or, or topic being looked at uh, on March the 4th. And we're pleased to announce that we'll also have a power hour uh, on March the 18th on the road ahead for tech policy, which will touch on the antitrust data privacy agenda and some other topics as well. We'll share registration details for those with you very shortly. So thank you again to our incredible speakers. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Be well, stay safe, and we'll hope to connect with you again very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Thank you. Thanks.